Hey everybody, what's going on? This is Oliver, your host, and welcome to this podcast, Third House on the Left. And guys, have I got a treat for you today. It's awesome. I've met this guy randomly through TikTok. I was watching his video and he's amazing. He's good about money. He's got real estate. He's in Toronto right now, so he's going to share with us, you know, some good hints. So take a piece of paper and if you're driving, well, you'll have to listen to it again. So, hey, Jim. What's going hey, on? Hey, Oliver. Good. Thanks for, for finding me on TikTok. I was only there by pure accident. Accident. I wasn't even going to be on it. And then I found that once I started making some videos, people started watching. And now, 700 videos later and 40, over 40,000 followers, it seems that people like what I'm saying, which is fantastic. Because when I started, I don't know if you know, but I, was, uh, I took my daughter to a bouldering class, so there's rock, rock climbing. So I'm sitting in the parking lot and I'm, I'm bored because there's nothing to do. But my daughter, who's eight years old, had introduced me to TikTok. So I was like looking at TikTok and, and you know, entertaining myself. So she introduced myself. you to the TikTok, that's yeah. funny. Yeah, so I didn't know, I'm, I'm not on social media. I've never been on social media ever. I'm not on Facebook. The only thing I, I might have been on was LinkedIn. Uh, just, you know, in the past when I used to work, I put my resume there, but nothing ever happened there. But uh, TikTok, she showed me, and I, it was entertaining. I was like, I can't do any dances. But I, what I really liked about TikTok was that I could give a short one-minute clip of information, and that's it. I'm done. Yeah, I don't exactly. have to do any. I don't exactly. have to do anything else. That, that's what's so, really cool about it, and, that, and that's what I love about it. You have to be punchy, and you have to be short. So. Uh, actually stuff like you share are really relevant about like a really precise point so that's what i love about it thank you thank you and and, and then you reached out to me i think i met you on tiktok yeah and uh, here we are so that's fantastic uh, i actually everyone knows for me this is the weird thing on tiktok everyone asked me real estate questions but i made my money originally in stocks but no one cares about that as much <laughs> <laughs> so they always want to talk about my experiences in real estate, which is fine. I mean, they, they want to hear what they want to hear. Well, so. actually, tell me a little bit about it. Like, what was your, like, your first job? How did you start in stock? My, well, I, I grew up, I'm the first generation born in Canada. My parents were immigrants. So they came here to Montreal. They actually went to Montreal first because my dad is Good. Mauritian. And they, he speaks Creole or some uh, form of uh, French. Uh, yeah. yeah. So they went in Montreal. And eventually, because of the economy at the time, they, they got jobs in Toronto, so they moved there, and I was born there. I was born to a very poor family in, in terms of, you know, today, if someone wants an iPhone 11, they just go out and they press a couple buttons and they get it. In, in our family, a Christmas gift was a real gift. Like, you, you planned for a year, and then you got a Christmas gift. So I would yeah. get... I would get like a transformer or Reebok pump shoes after waiting for a year. And then I would get it. Like that was a real gift. It wasn't like instantaneous gratification. It was the yeah, opposite. I remember I used to have GI Joe. I was big on. Are you Joe. serious? Oh, I love yeah. that show. Or, or, or Ninja Turtle back in the days. I remember. Oh my God. I, I, I was freaking out every like at Christmas time. Forget about it. Like I was the cartoons. You would watch that? Like five days I would disappear <laughs> with my gift. <laughs> so I totally remember that. So, so yeah, GI Joe and Transformers, like the cartoons, you would watch them religiously. You'd play the toys yeah. and the whole bit. And um, but one thing my parents brought uh, from when when they when they immigrated was a, a very strong educational focus, almost unnaturally strong. They wanted me to get extremely high marks. If I didn't get a hundred percent, it was insufficient. Ooh. Not enough. Well, that's a lot of pressure, 100%. Wow. So because every time I got anything lower, you know, 70, why isn't it higher? You know, and then they would say, you obviously need more tutoring. So they would, you know, give me more lessons. 80, not good enough. 90, not good enough. Like it has to be higher and higher. And then when I was 14, I had reached uh, 14 or 15. I reached like a 94 or 93% average on all my subjects. Wow. And my my parents were like that's really good you know time to do the next semester and i was like wait 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 what are we doing like this is so painful like i've been doing this for almost 10 years now and the only thing that i have to look forward to is the next semester yeah like wh wh why why am i doing this and so my my 
I guess my parents decided to talk to me. He's like, we're going to tell you now. After dinner, we'll tell you why you're doing this. I'm like, great. Someone's going to tell me why I'm doing this. The reason why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when I was 14, I'm sitting there. I'm listening, really paying attention because I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm killing myself. But what, why am I doing this? Because, you know, when you go into to uh, get these marks, you get to go to a great high school because you're just almost going to high school. High school was grade 10 and above. Yeah. In high school, they have basic at that time, basic, general and advanced courses. So English would have three levels. Physics would have three levels. Everyone would have three levels. And they want, so we want you in the advanced. All the courses need to be advanced. And I'm like, okay, so why, why, why? Well, then when you get great marks at the advanced level, you get to go to any university you want. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. so, so now what? Because then I go to university. <laughs> and so well, after university, you get top tier marks in a top tier profession and you get to work for a blue chip company and you get to make money. And I said, uh, so I need to suffer for the next 10 years at minimum yeah. to make money. That's what you're telling me. And my, my mom said, yes, that's it. And, and I, I, actually, we, we can't blame them because that's exactly how they learn it. Huh? That's exactly what, what they've been taught. So they're like, well, uh, we're going to just share the same thing with our kids. Like, go to school, that's right. get a job. Go to school, get a job, yeah. work there for 50 years, and then have some money. Yeah. But when I was 14, I, uh, I said, I have a great idea. How about, <laughs> why don't we study money now? Instead of studying all this other stuff, the math, the physics, the science, the... Mm -hmm. the why don't we study money? And then within 10 years, I'll probably have a lot of knowledge about that. And then when I, you know, I won't probably need to follow this path. I could, I could get a detour. And wow, my mom that, said, that's unusual actually that you at 14 years old started to think about, I need to learn about money. That that's unusual. It was only I because I honestly, like I really, I, I started like mid twenties. to so like, really, that's still like, early. Oh, I need to, I need to learn more about money. That's because you were having so much fun and money was so easy. It just kept coming. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Money's never easy. But no, my I'm parents just said, um, my parents just said, it doesn't work that way. And they just ended the conversation. I think it goes to what you just said. They didn't know any other way to say it. They didn't know yeah. any other way. Yeah. Uh, and, and I respect them because they provided me with education, with shelter, with food, you know, everything I needed. But this one thing, they couldn't help me. And what they said was like, it doesn't work that way. Just follow the plan. And I think my marks peaked shortly after that. And my marks started declining because eventually uh, the day, the night that uh, after that talk, I was sitting in bed running the conversation in my head, exactly what my parents said, what I needed to do. And I was thinking it can't be true. Like what they're saying cannot be true because number one, so this is 14 years old. I said, number one, if this path actually worked, then all of my peers at school, all 2,000 of my students, all their parents, all my relatives, they should have money because they all follow this mm. path. They should have it, right? But when I go to family reunions, parties, no one ever talks about having enough money. They always have anxiety about money. I can't have enough to pay the food, the university, the bills, the mortgage. I said, if the path gave me money, why is everyone complaining about not having enough money? There's something wrong. If the path worked, I should meet at least a few people who said, I followed the path. I made enough money. I'm done. I'm good. I don't need to work. That, that's funny because so out of logic, like you didn't have anybody in your surrounding proving that going to school would give you a good enough salary to, you know, not worry about all those things. That, that's, that's really good right. thinking. And I'm actually surprised that you thought about it so young. I, I was, it was mostly because of the suffering. My parents were very rigid about studying. I studied every day, hours at a time, and I just didn't want to keep doing it. I, I was yeah. like, this is painful. So I was looking for a way out. It wasn't any ah. type of, it wasn't any type of, wow, you're, looking you're such for a, a way out of this pain. That, that's funny. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was that, like, what? That, that's I one way to get motivated, actually. You know, when you want to get out of pain, you're motivated to learn something new or a exactly way to do it. Yeah. That's right. That's what they, there's a saying I've heard uh, from a real estate investor who says, uh, the only way to get a, uh, a dog to get up from lying down on a, on a needle 
is to make sure that there's enough pain. Otherwise, the dog won't move. Yeah. They'll just lie there. Exactly. <laughs> That's a and, good and, analogy. And, my, and so I just wanted to get out. And so right. my parents told me this way, and I looked at around me. Nobody, nobody was, had that success. So that was wrong. I knew that was wrong. And then the next thing I thought about, this was maybe uh, uh, the next day, I said, somebody out there, I don't know who, somebody in the history of mankind, in the history of man, someone must have attained financial freedom. They must have attained it. They must have found out how to do it. And they must have wrote it down. So if they wrote it down, mm, the only place point, yeah. it could be, the only place it could, because there was no podcast, there was no Facebook. No, there was, there was nothing nobody. back then. I know. It was all written. There was so it books. was all yeah. books. It must be in the bookstore or, or, the library. or maybe in infomercials. Cause I've seen a ton of this. Oh, they all I, look I, dodgy I, though. Huh? I, I, I'll tell you a story. I actually went to one of those infomercial seminars because I was so desperate. So <laughs> I was so desperate. So the first thing, so in high school, I was, again, now you're thinking about someone who's 15, 16. And I saw this infomercial. You might not be familiar, but it was in the eighties and it was Tom Vu. Tom Vu was the guy. He was on TV at two or three in the morning talking about, he was always sitting in his boat with all these girls in bikinis and talking about how you can get rich quick with real estate. And Tom Vu, I was like, that's great. I need to learn how to make money in real estate. Yeah. And so I didn't have $500 because that's what the, the introduction course was $500. I said, I don't have $500. So I convinced two of my friends. I said, why don't we put our money together and then we'll send, one of my friends was really smart. I said, why don't we send him and he can take notes. And then once we figure out what he's doing, we'll just do that. Hmm. And then uh, my friends, I don't even know why they agreed. <laughs> they agreed. <laughs> I was the only one who wanted to get out of my pain. So I was like, yeah, here's my one third. Everyone chipped in and we sent my friend. My friend sent went. And so we were waiting because it was a, it was like an eight hour, six to eight hour seminar. I was like, oh my God, he's learning all the That's secrets. That's hilarious, Jim, because honestly, <laughs> one of my first seminar was kind of like this. I convinced a friend because they, they were offering like a free ticket if you buy one. So I told my friend like, hey, let's pay half, half and then go. And so it was kind of like the same. That's funny. That's funny. And I went That's there and actually my friend was like, I don't like this. And you left. And I was like, wow, I want to stay there. I like it. And I stayed the whole weekend for half price that's amazing yeah so that's ex that's exactly what i did so my friends weren't as into it and um i don't even know why they agree because i think when you're a teenager and something's cool you just like try it like what the hell yeah. who cares what, what else am i doing and uh so so he went and we waited for him the next day i i i, I saw him at lunch i said so, so what happened tell me tell me everything he's like I, I i was ready i took my notepad and my pen and, and he didn't really say anything he just kept talking. It was all these stories and, and there was no actionable plan. Mm. And I said, well, tell me some of the stories. Like, tell me some of them. He goes, well, there were two stories that I wrote down. The first one was like, you know, you don't have to use your own money. If you use a credit card, the interest, you'll get the money. You have to pay interest. But if you can make money more than what the credit card costs, that's a profit. And I said, okay, well, that's interesting. What's the next story? And he said, well, the next story is, there was uh, an old lady and she had a home and it was worth uh, maybe uh, 120,000 and uh, there was uh, her spouse had died. So she needed to sell the house quickly. And, but when she listed it at 120, it took very long to sell It's regular, regular market price and the market wasn't strong. So the house just sat there, but she needed the money to pay for the funeral, to pay for the moving costs, to make downsizing. And so he, uh, Tom Vu was able to come in, and negotiate a price that was very low, like 80 grand. He put in 10 grand, fix it up, 90 grand now. Uh, and then he put it on the market for rent and he got like, uh, whatever he got, like a thousand dollars a month. And, and he cash flow right away. And, his, and he was able to refinance and pull out some equity. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And there were yeah. so many questions. And I said, and when I told people this story, they said, oh my God, that's so terrible. Why are you taking advantage of old people? Oh but I, God, I didn't, yeah. I didn't yeah. think of it that way. I was thinking, no, I understand because I was reading at the same time. Mm. People have problems. They have big problems. The problem that she had was she wanted money now. Now she didn't yeah. want the house. I don't want the house. I want the money. If you could give me the money, that would be great. I'll give you this house because this house 
has property tax, insurance, maintenance, landscaping, capital expense. I need the money. Yeah, the and classic could, uh, distressed property. It was a burden for them, so they wanted the money. Not, not that's the, right. And if you yeah. could provide that solution, bingo. You exactly. come out well, they come out well. And that's what I took away from it. But at that time, Toronto was going through a housing boom, like, like you wouldn't believe. 86, 87, it was just prices were just doubling and tripling. Everyone was, was talking about how they were going to retire early. And then that's when I went into university during the last housing crash in Toronto. So I experienced the last housing downturn that the city has seen uh, so far. In the 90s, huh, if I remember. That's right. And the prices went down from the late 80s, 89, all the way down to 95. Like just, And I know some people lost their homes. Um, and my parents, when I was buying property in the so, U.S. So actually, I, I, I just want to stop you there because sure. like prices right now are going up really fast. And like real estate is booming right now in Canada. And a lot of people think that like you, you can't go back. Prices can't go down. But it actually happened. So if it happened in history, it might happen again. So I'm just like, I don't want to be the, the, the you know, the prophet of disaster, but I mean, it could happen. I don't think you know, interest rate will go up as much as they went in the nineties, but, but you know, it could happen. Just saying, you know, take precaution. I agree. I agree. And you know, that, that brings another point. There's two types of investors. There's people who are surfers. They just ride the wave, the rave up. And then there's people like me who are bottom feeders. After the, the market has destroyed itself, I come in and I start looking around. I say, hey, what's going on here? So there's, there's definitely, there's other types of investors, but those are the two that I've noticed. Like the ones who surf, surf the market up, surf the market down. And there's some who just go in when there's a disaster and they start looking around like a garage sale. Hey, what's over here? What are you getting rid of? <laughs> so when the market was crashing and when I started buying U.S. real estate, my parents told me back, he goes, do you remember when you were in university and the housing market destroyed itself? I was like, yeah, I had no money. I couldn't do anything. He says, well, you know, our neighbor's house, they had to sell it. And it was 140000 the townhouse, and they were selling it for seventy. Your dad and I were talking about buying it, but we got so scared we didn't. And then we just he said, forget about it. And I said, oh, my God, why did you do that? He goes, that, that house now is worth like half a million dollars. And she was like, well, we were scared. We didn't know. Like everything was crashing. And yeah. I said, you know, when the, if that happens to me, I am not making that mistake. I am going and I'm just going to buy whatever I could find as fast as I can. And that's what happened like 20 years later. The U.S. housing market destroyed itself. And I said, this is the, the, what my mom was talking about. I am not going to sit down and just wait for it to pass. I'm going to go there and start buying stuff. And besides, I want U.S. dollars. I mean, I love Canada. Don't get me wrong. Can Canadian Canada has been great to me. I love this country. But U.S. dollars can't be beat. Like, U.S. dollar is good everywhere, like no matter where I go. So, so that, that's how pretty much how it started in terms of my interest in investing. And, uh, and I actually, before did, that. Did you actually had a job when you, uh, when you um, finished university? Did you get a job? So that's a great question. So. University, I actually failed out of university because um, I didn't fail out, but I failed second year. So what happened was when I realized that this wasn't the path to money, my marks started going down. And in second year, I just stopped going to class. I was, I remember sitting in class and I was looking at my statistics teacher teaching some ridiculous stuff about something. And I said, what, what is this? And then I would go to the next class and they would teach something about thermodynamics and ideals. I was like, my God, I will never, ever use this anywhere. Yeah. You know, and I stopped going to class and then I failed. Um, my parents were pretty upset. My mom started crying. Yeah, my mom started crying. And I was trying to explain how it was pointless, but, you know, that was different. It's a different era. So, so I said, what would you do then? What was the I next said, step for you? So I failed second year and I said, my mom was crying and saying, we came to this country and, you know, we had so many hopes that you would get a North American education, you'd be the first generation, you know, da, da, da. I said, fine, I'll set up a very basic study schedule and just finish the degree with like 70% or 75 or something like that. And we'll just get the paper. So two more years later, I finished up the degree. I said, here's a degree. I didn't even go to commencement. I, I didn't, even, I said, I'm not going to commencement. Here's the paper. And, uh, 
let's, let's move on. Let's move on. And then back then I graduated was the mid nineties. That was when the internet started. So back then everyone was using a modem to dial up. American online, they were using a disc yeah. to get American online, $15 a month, internet access. And again, my friends and I, the, the same friends actually, that with the Tom Vu seminar, let's start an internet company. Mm. <laughs> 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 and why not? We're not working anyway. We just graduated. Yeah. Why don't we just start an internet company? For some reason, we thought that was a good idea. And so there was four of us. Uh, and uh, three of us were graduated and the fourth one was doing their master's in engineering. He loved school. So he just loved studying. So we're like, whatever, but he was very smart. So we're like, we'll put you on the team, but you know, you go finish your master's. So we started an internet company with four people and we started doing, it was crazy. I was in my early twenties and all these giant companies wanted to work with us. Um, Prentice hall, Deutsche bank, uh, the, wow. the national institutes of health, the uh, mass mutual insurance in Boston. And they all had work. I couldn't believe it because nobody knew anything about the internet. They had the paper, faxes, phone. Yeah. They, nobody knew oh anything. God. But as an engineer, you were given the internet for the whole time you're in school. The internet was only available to the, to the military and to technical students in university at the time. No one else knew about it or had it or had much familiarity with it. But we were already programming it back then. So when we came out, they had a very simple request. We had, they said, we have a lot of documents, regulatory documents, public disclosure documents, press releases. We need you to build something where our staff, which has no idea how to use anything except Microsoft Word, we need our staff to use this tool that you build for us to push information onto our website. That's all we want you to do. And at back then, that's what all the internet was. They just wanted yeah, to push their, their paper documents into the internet so they could have public disclosure to their investors, to their customers, or to whatnot. And so... so that like was your first business venture. And it was four people. And then yeah. we merged with another group who was another 20-year-old group, a, a, a group run by a 20-year-old who had like 10 people. And eventually, before the dot-com crash, we had 400 people. Like we had 400 wow. people. We had a marketing department, graphic wow. artists, architects, database administrators. We had everybody. And I was there almost at the beginning. And oh, we lost you, Jim. Are you still oh, there? Hold on a second. I, I need okay. to hold on. I need to take this call just one second. Okay, go ahead. internet company and that took me off track a little bit but it did give me a lot of money the, the the companies back then paid really well as you can i don't know if you remember the dot-com boom again same thing with real estate stocks tech stocks were going up 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 yeah um compensation they were throwing stock options everything and then in 2001 or 2002 everything just crashed my stock options getting worthless um all my peers, which were all engineers, they all bought tech companies, which became worthless. And I avoided the tech companies because I started reading when I was 14. I was reading when I was 14. And when I started working in the tech sector, I looked at the companies and I could already read the income statement and the balance sheet already because I'd already had practice, like 10 years of practice of looking at income statements and balance sheets. And I said, this doesn't make any sense. They're not making any money. Like the revenues are very sketchy and the, the earnings are very non-existent. And yet they're, they're worth $1 billion, $2 billion. So I, I said, this, is, this can't be right. So even though I worked in the tech sector and everyone talked about, I bought Nortel, I bought JDS Uniface, I bought Cisco, oh I bought, God. they would say, what did you buy, Jim? I said, uh, I bought this television studio, you know, out in, the, in America. And they make a show called the Oprah Winfrey Show. And they make some, they make a good, they make a lot of money producing and syndicating the Oprah Winfrey Show. They said, that's boring. He goes, TV's yesterday. No one pay, pays attention to TV. I said, they make a lot of money with Oprah. They're like, we don't care about Oprah. Oprah's yesterday. And I said, okay, whatever. But they were making a lot of money. And, um, and then I bought a utility. Consolidated Edison produced electricity for the northeast part of America. And they paid an 8% dividend, which is unheard of. That's, 8%. Yeah, that's, that's really good. 
back then. They kept paying 8%. I don't even have to worry about it. And, and then wow. they were like, that's so boring. 8%, I'm making 200%. And I said, okay, whatever. I don't care. We're, we're, not, we're, we're not talking the same language. No, exactly. When the internet prices crashed, my company survived, you know, because you can't shut off electricity and mm. people, people still watch TV, but they weren't going to, you know, pets.com anymore. And they weren't doing a AOL online, like the Yahoo and everything was crashing. And that gave me enough money to start investing uh, in real estate. And so back then, that was shortly after the Toronto housing market crash. So prices were very low. And if you've ever been in a market like that, right now in the current climate in real estate, a bull market is characterized by big differences in values based on location. So if in downtown Toronto, I'm sure in downtown Montreal, the price per square foot for a similarly structured pr a property would be maybe double or triple what it would be an hour away, yeah. there, would be a, there would be a price separation. But during a downturn, during a, a market crash, there is no price discrepancy. So a that's, downtown- That's a really good indication. Like, like guys, if you're listening to this, that's a really good indication because right now prices are exactly what you're saying. There's a major difference between downtown and in the suburbs. Suburb. So, so that's, that's really, so that's indication. one, one indicator is that yeah. as the bull market continues, the separation grows like this, yeah, right? Exactly. And, and then in a, in a bear market, the opposite happens. Everything starts going like this. So back in the late nineties, a downtown Bay street condo would be the same price as an hour North one bedroom condo, same price. Wow. It would be maybe difference by 5,000. It would be 190, 195, like that. And so wow. I was looking at this and I had already been studying stocks. So I understood like price and value and stuff like that. And I looked at it, I yeah. said, there's, there's, a, there's two, again, the logic kicked in again. It was like, there's either two conclusions. The downtown property is severely undervalued or the suburb property is extremely overvalued. One of them, they can't be both like this. Exactly. Right? Since I didn't know which one, I bought both of them. I said, you know, hmm. one's going to be right. I mean, and, and, <laughs> the, the, right. <laughs> and the price was so low at the time, uh, 190 for uh, one bedroom. It was like, you know, whatever. Like, I mean, it can't be off by too much. It might, well, it'll be off by maybe 10 or 20,000 at most. And I'll make that up with inflation in five years. It doesn't make any difference. And besides, most of it's not my money anyway. It's the bank's money. And uh, the inflation and will, will. So you bought both of them, and did you did you rent it? Or did so you... I rent I rented out uh, uh, both of them. Okay. And then uh, and then I. Were waited. you making any cash flow? At one ninety, there was no cash flow even back okay. then. Okay. Even back then, there was no cash flow. Because I know Toronto is pretty much like Montreal; it's an appreciation market. So you're not making much cash Correct. flow, but you're appreciating a lot. Correct. So. That's what I was banking on. I said, something's yeah. going to appreciate either the suburb or the downtown or both. Yeah. And because of what we've seen now in the last 20 years, it was both, right? So both started appreciating. But then when the U.S. market crash happened, I needed money. So I started liquidating all my Toronto stuff. So I had a, I had a, a home uh, in two homes in the suburb, one downtown. I started liquidating everything. And the only thing I kept was a one bedroom where I squeezed my wife and I in there. I said that like, we're just going to spend everything in the U S and we're going to live small here. We can live large later when the U S dollars start coming in. We'll live, we'll contract our living now to free up capital to go into this distressed market now, because this opportunity is not going to stay forever. If it's just like Toronto, it will close four, five, six years. It will just close and it'll be over. We need to take advantage now. And my wife was, was even more aggressive. She was like, well, we liquidated everything. Let's go into leverage. Let's like leverage all this stuff. And I was like, no, 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 that's not, okay. Like the last thing I want to do is like have a great opportunity and have it taken from me because I can't afford the leverage. I need to yeah. make sure we can keep everything. I want to keep everything. So, uh, so, uh, so that's what happened. Tell me right there, well, what, what would you attribute like, because obviously you probably had a lot of knowledge for you to like decide at this point to liquidate everything and pour you money into real estate in when the crash happened in the States. Cause actually I started about like right a little bit before the crash 
the States. So 2007, eight. So when the crash happened, I was like, cool, but I don't have any money. I don't have anything. And, you know, I had a girlfriend who didn't want to, you know, didn't want to liquidate everything and, and, and yeah. downsize. So I figured like, okay, I'm just going to watch it. But obviously I missed a really big wave. So now I'm so much more prepared because I missed this one. So I think you think it was because you, you know, you, you had, you know, a lot of knowledge about the economy, money and how it works and all that stuff. It wasn't like that. When I started no. reading it, like I said, it was about the stock market, right? Yeah. So when I started reading when I was 14, it is in, a, in part to what you're saying. I had some knowledge, but I didn't have that much knowledge. I, w I had knowledge from the right people. You can have too much knowledge. If you have too much knowledge about the wrong things, you're just going to make a whole bunch of mistakes. That's a good point. Right? Yeah. I, had the, I, I was lucky to have the right knowledge. So when I started reading, I started reading books by Peter Lynch, who was very numbers oriented. Like this, if the numbers don't make sense, you know, don't do it, this, that. It wasn't momentum driven or appreciation driven type of writing. Then, then he, he mentioned Warren Buffett as the best investor back uh, then. And I tried to convince my mom to buy Warren Buffett stock. It like, it's only 13,000. They're like, are you crazy? $13,000? We're not going to pay $13,000 for one share. Now it's like 300 and something thousand, but whatever. Yeah. Anyway, so, so I read Warren Buffett and Warren Buffett talked about the same thing. He talked about markets going up markets going down. They always do this. It's like normal. It's, it's like the sun coming up and the sun coming down. No matter what people say, when the sun comes up, it will go down again. And when the sun goes down, no matter what people say, it'll come up again. It's inevitable. It's been doing that for 20 years. So I wasn't afraid of crashes. I know people panic. But I was thinking around me when I, when I went through the Black Monday and I went through the dot-com crash, I said, why is everyone panicking? The sun will come up tomorrow. It's inevitable. But mm -hmm. what I didn't realize at the time was people over leveraged themselves so they get wiped out completely. So like, I was like, if the sun comes up tomorrow, it doesn't matter. You know, it's, it'll come up. But if you get wiped out, then the sun doesn't come up for you. You have to start from the beginning. So I just, I just said to myself, after reading all this literature and all, this, all these books, I said, if I don't go into heavy leverage, I, the sun will come up eventually. So I don't need to worry. So, so that so, would be a really good lesson then. Don't, don't get yourself into too much over leverage. Yeah, leverage is very dangerous. So I'll go into leverage a bit more. A, a lot of people don't ask me about leverage, but it actually is very important to understand. Well, it, how it, it is important. And I know in real estate, obviously, you know, you, you can easily get into over leverage uh, and you can get into, uh, you know, leverage with stocks. So uh, you know, that's right. Yeah. And, and I think one of the questions that people don't ask is they, they just stop their knowledge at oh don't over leverage yourself but what they need to ask next is what does over leverage mean exactly what does it mean yeah right just to, to say it is great but if you if you when you get wiped out you need to figure out why did i get wiped out right that's not the mm -hmm. time to learn it you should learn it before <laughs> so when <laughs> it would be a good idea <laughs> yeah. let's learn it now before it happens <laughs> yeah so i don't go there right i remember um there was a saying that says if someone tells me where i'm going to die uh, if someone knows where I'm going to die, just tell me where, where, where it's going to happen and I'll make sure not to go there. So, yeah. so, <laughs> so it's the same thing like leverage. If you tell me at what leverage point I will get wiped out, I'll make sure not to go there. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I knew markets would come up and down. So when the dot-com crash happened, I didn't care. I just started buying stocks. I said, that's the opportunity. Markets always go up and down. So now it's down. I started buying. So I started yep. buying Berkshire Hathaway and it recovered just like all the books told me it would for the last 150 years. So I said, this is an easy game. This game is easy. Uh, and then the stock market started crashing again uh, during the Great Recession, but so did real estate at the same time. And then I was like, what do I do now? I don't have enough money. Like, I don't have enough money to take advantage of both opportunities. And they're both really great opportunities. Yeah, yeah they were. Stocks are down by like 50%. Real yeah. estate's down by almost 40 what, what, I don't know what to do. So I sat down with my wife and I said, um, so what, what should we do? Like, I don't know. Like uh, we've already invested in stocks. Do we keep going? So I, I still didn't know what to do. And I went to lunch with one of my friends. One of my friends is uh, a Bay street banker. You know, he makes a lot of money and he spends a lot of money. He lives life. He loves life. So he's always like, he would do the European vacation over the weekend and he would spend all his money and, and he would never, uh, he would never drive. He would always be driven. He would, 
even if it was a, a block to go to the movie theater, I'm like, I'm at the movie theater. And he's like, don't worry, I'm going to get an Uber. I was like, you just walk here. He's like, I'm not walking. I'm taking an Uber. <laughs> so, he, so he made a lot and he spent a lot. And so we sat down for lunch. And this was 2009. And he said, uh, he wanted to talk to me. He's like, oh, you should check out the States, the real estate market in the States, you know, because you like crashes. He knew I like crashes. And I said, why? He said, well, my parents are in BC and they're looking for a, a retirement uh, winter home in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And you, don't you won't believe what you see there. You won't believe it. The prices, my parents are telling me the prices are ridiculous. Yeah, I was like, what's worry. ridiculous? I no said, worry. what do you mean ridiculous? Because, because the condos here, a two bedroom condo at the time was a quarter of a million. I said, what's, what's, what's ridiculous? Like a hundred thousand? He's like, no, he goes, just, just take a look. So I looked very quickly. I just do, did a quick search on some of the houses. And I said, oh my God, they're not 200. They're not 100. No. They're 20. Some of them are five in Detroit. Some, some of the houses crazy. were five. Then I looked on YouTube and I saw a house flipper on YouTube. He doesn't get many views even today. He was in Detroit. He was a house flipper. And I looked at him and he had a team of guys who did work for him. And he was talking about why this $3,000 house was better than this $1,000 house. And I, I couldn't, my mind was just... I couldn't understand what he was talking about. And he was like, I can renovate this $3,000 house, put in $500, fix this up, fix that up. And then uh, we can probably rent it for $800. And I was like, what is happening? Yeah. Those numbers are crazy <laughs> for us Canadians. Huh? That's it's, right. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Cause... So then I said, I need to go there. I told my wife, I said, we need to buy U.S. real estate for two reasons. Number one, this opportunity of a century. Everyone was telling us it's the opportunity of the century. And number two, I wanted to stop working. If I could replace our household income, if I could replace the cash flow with rental cash flow, that means working becomes optional, right? Yeah. If I if I replace it all, then I then the, the other cash flow becomes. If I work, great. If I don't work, great. Doesn't matter. I, exactly. I can decide. So, I I said, and my wife said, where should we invest? I don't know. America's big, and this sounds stupid, but I remember I said. Well, I don't want to invest in Hawaii because it's really far, which sounds silly because, I mean, Phoenix, I ended up investing in Phoenix. Phoenix is really far too, but I just didn't like the fact that it was in the ocean. So for whatever reason, the ocean scared me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I said, oh, I don't want to cross an ocean because if there happens to be a problem, I don't want to cross an ocean to get to it. But I'm yeah. okay flying across the continental US, apparently. Exactly. And then, uh, so I said, well, so then again, because of my knowledge about balance sheets and, and, and numbers, as I'm sure you're aware when you're trying to manage costs. I'm saying, I'm thinking, well, I don't like natural disasters because I'm sure a natural disaster will increase my insurance rates. I'm mm -hmm. sure if a hurricane tears through my neighborhood regularly or a, or a tornado, my insurance will be higher than if a, if a tornado does not tear through my neighborhood. So I want some place with no natural disasters. Number two, I need strong Landlord friendly areas. That's a really good point too. Like uh, landlord friendly. Why would I go to a place where they're not friendly to me? I want some place where they welcome me being a landlord. Yeah. So I had to cut all those down. And then thankfully most of those uh, states are warm. Anyway, so then uh, landlord friendly. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> actually, could you like explain a little bit what, what would be a friendly, a landlord friendly states? just for our for, listener who doesn't know about it. Generally, it has to do around anywhere around evictions and going into the property. So when you're talking to a place where it's tenant friendly or landlord unfriendly, tenants can really drag out the legal process. You can't really go in for any reason. Uh, you have to have certain processes to follow to go into non-payment of rent is not a reason to go into a unit. Where some places in the States, if you don't pay rent, they can just come in and just <laughs> shake you down. But yeah. that's different. But uh, non-payment of rent is not even a, a reason to evict in some locations. Some locations, non-payment of rent means you have to file something before you can even start the process of evicting. Like you can't evict just because they didn't pay. So in the, in the places that I invested, if you don't pay, you get five days and then the process starts. The process starts and within two weeks, you can get a sheriff at the door to throw you out. So within the month, you could be gone if you don't pay your rent this or you don't catch so up. This is so much better. This is because here in Montreal, this, it's 
so much tenant friendly. It's it's almost ridiculous, like to the point where it's like not ridiculous at almost. <laughs> <laughs> Toronto's beyond that too. Ontario is yeah. very very uh, uh, tenant friendly, which is fine. I understand having protections for tenants, but if yeah, you want to be a landlord, if you want to be a landlord, then if you had a choice, all I'm saying is that if you had a choice, you probably want to go to a jurisdiction that likes you. Yeah, exactly. It's the same thing, right? Exactly. So if you go to a company and you want to be hired, you want to make sure that your coworkers actually like you. They don't like you. Why are you there? You're not going to have a good time. Good point. Yeah, so, so, so I narrowed it down by natural disasters, and by landlord friendly. And then I narrowed it down further. When I decided on Phoenix, I wanted no tourism. And that turned out to be good because now that Airbnbs are getting destroyed, mm, I didn't okay. want tourism. I said, so I, said so I could you didn't want a fluctuation of, of like whatever happens, people wouldn't come in and because tourism so wouldn't work. Okay, I get it. Tourism at the time was booming. People said, like, you can make triple the, the, the income if you went into an Airbnb situation or into a tourist city like Las Vegas. Yeah. But I knew from reading everything that I've read since I was a teenager that everything comes with a cost. Nothing's free. There's nothing free. You, the, the, there's someone, someone's not telling you the other side. If someone tells you mm. something that's really good, like when I was younger, you can make 56% return on this real estate investment, but they don't talk about the leverage they're using, right? Or mm. how the fact that they're not accounting for all the expenses or there, there's something missing in the story, right? So when someone said you can make three times the rent in a rental, a vacation property, I said, I want stable. I don't want, there's something I, I'm paying for something for, to get that higher rent. It's not free. So I want stable people who live there, who work there and who regularly want to build a life there. And, and I wanted and, to, Jim, do you think that being more stable like this, is it more, your investor type of personality or do you think like it's like most of the big investor and most of the people that make a lot of money are looking towards more stable? They are because they make money differently. When you're looking at the people who like vacation properties are typically those who don't have much money. So they're looking at that as their solution, their jackpot. They mm -hmm. want a high rent. They want to make quick money. Quick money. That's right. Okay. As you know, in real estate, quick money, comes and goes. What a sophisticated investor do, he wants to make stable income per door, but in order to make more money, they're not looking for fluctuations or high values. What they're looking for is scale. So they, won't, they, don't, they don't want um, high revenue generating doors. They want a regular generating door, but a lot of scale. Dozens, hundreds of units. That's how they make their money. Yeah, okay. Right? And I learned that when I went to Phoenix, I bumped into one of these investors who was extremely wealthy and I was buying houses and he's like, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm buying houses. They're so cheap. And I was showing him the numbers. He's like, you need to stop this stupid shit. He's like, this is stupid. I said, what, what are you talking about? And, um, but going back a bit, I picked Phoenix because of those reasons, you know, it's stable, large population, landlord friendly, and no hurricanes, tornadoes coming through my city. Yeah. And I bumped into this investor. And uh, he was from Minnesota and we were using the same agent. And he's like, what are you doing uh, down here? He was about 20 years older than me. I was in my thirties. So he was uh, probably in his fifties, uh, maybe even 60 if, 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 if it's possible. But he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm buying these houses. I can buy them for $30,000 or $50,000 and I can put a tenant in for a thousand and it's cash flow positive. And he's like, you need to stop this. This is stupid. And this is the first time I bumped into this mindset, which now, mm -hmm. It's too late for me now. I wish I had the mindset back then. It would have helped me. He's like, you know how long it's going to take you to scale to any significant revenue this way? You're going to have to be buying houses every week forever. He's like, this is it's too slow. It's too slow. He's like, you need to find a partner or be able to secure financing and go big. Like, this, like how many houses are you going to buy? I was like, I don't know. I was so happy. I, I kept buying them. So I kept doing my, my thing and he did his thing. And then a year later, he hadn't bought anything and bought anything in a year. I was buying houses. At that time, I maybe had um, maybe about five houses at that time. And I bought short sale. Uh, short sale is when the, um, the, the value of the home is less than the mortgage value. So yeah. the mortgage value is here and the house value is here. So the bank knows that it cannot recover their mortgage. 
So they come to an agreement with the owner of the home and they said, fine, if you can find a buyer for this price, we'll discharge the mortgage. We can both walk away and, you know, no harm done, right? If you can find a buyer, there was no buyers. Like I saw communities where every third house or every third condo was vacant, 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 vacant. Wow. And, um, you know, when you talk to a real estate agent, they put you on a mailing list. There's something called MLS, Flex MLS. It gives you a listing of all the properties that come up right away. It hits your, yeah. you, you hits your feed. So I log in. My agent sent me out of this. And immediately, my screen was flooded. Thousands of listings, thousands of short sales, just flooding wow. my screen. And I, I was overwhelmed. And every day, dozens would hit dozens boom 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 and i was like i can't keep track this is too much like it's too much yeah, information too much. and i said I, can, I need to find a way to to narrow this down i can't make a decision i i can't narrow i need to narrow this down i i can't look over thousands and thousands of units so i i logged into the the city of phoenix website and mm -hmm. i went to their their police and crime division and i and i wanted to look at their data with regards to crime uh, and so they separated the division out to property crime and violent crime. I said, property crime, not great, but violent crime because I, I need property management. I need them to be safe when they go look at the property. I don't need them to be mugged or shot yeah. or otherwise assaulted. So I want to pick areas with no violent crime for sure. So I started looking at the data and I found out all the zip codes that had high and medium levels of violent crime. I went to my list. I cut them all out. I cut out all the zip codes that had high violent or moderate violent crime. I wanted pristine crime-free areas as far as violent crime is concerned. So that left me from a thousand. It took me down to maybe 300. Right. And this is really, really good tools. Actually, there's a lot of great tools. If you want to buy in the U S you know, compared to here in Canada, if you want to have those yes. statistics and stuff, I mean, you, you can't go on the web and find it because it's not there. But in the that. U.S., there's, there's so much great tool to, like you're saying, narrow it down, check up the crime rate, check up the, the area. You, you yes. can get so much information on the net. It's crazy. There is. And there's so much in-migration in America. That means in-migration, meaning that people travel from state to state a lot, more mm -hmm. so, I think, than maybe Canadians travel between provinces. And a lot of times there's a lot of these message boards about people who are like in Chicago and they want to relocate to Tampa or they want to go from LA and they want to go to Ohio and people start telling people about the good, the bad and ugly about, you know, if I have a family, what's good about going to Ohio? Where, where should I live? And you start reading that as well. So I read those. And then I finally found the zip codes that I like 300 of them. Then I had to decide what I wanted because 300 is still too much. And I said, I want at least two bed and two bath. I want a family could live there. You know, one bedroom, one bath is great for a bachelor, great returns because the price is so low, but I thought my market was too small. Like it could only be bachelor or someone who's single. So I wanted my market to be a bit bigger. I'm willing to pay a bit more, especially when the price difference was 10,000. Who cares? Yeah. And then, and um, because the one bedroom was 20,000 and a two bedroom was 35,000. I said, who cares? That's so, so different. I'd rather have a bigger market by buying a, a place that could suit to a, uh, someone with a child. Uh, and then I cut all those out and that left me with about a hundred, maybe a hundred from 300 to a hundred. Then at that point, I noticed that they were in community, they were clustered. So you would see 20 in one neighborhood. Like, like I said, that neighborhood where every other house is foreclosed or short yeah. sale, yeah. there would be clustered. So my agent, I would say this area has a lot of opportunity. Go there. He would go there because there's so many for, things for him to see. The last thing an agent wants to do is crisscross the whole city, trying to find the property you're looking for. You know, oh, I have to go up north and I have to drive two hours down south and then I have to go eat. Like, this was great because there was literally in one area would be a dozen townhouses, condos and houses that were short sale. And he would just go there and he would say, this, 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 I like this. I don't like that. You know, this is a, an opportunity here or I wouldn't come here. Don't come here. Like, it might not have violent crime, but it has a lot of drug crime, like a lot of drug usage here. So don't, don't, don't do this. Don't not here. And so... So he helped me a lot. And then I would start buying them where he thought was the best because I had narrowed it down so much. There was only a few left and I just started picking. And one of the first uh, places I picked up was a golf course. Back then golf was popular in the eighties and nineties golf was popular. So there was a lot of golfing communities, especially in Arizona, golf communities with condos and swimming pools. 
beautiful, gorgeous, well-maintained community. Um, and the condos was 35,000. I said, 35,000, wow. let's try it. You know, my first try, so the end of 2009, I put an offer in, $35,000. Um, actually, it was 40,000, right? And then we did an inspection. You never do an inspection now, but apparently you can buy real, you can go really, you can go as slow as you want in a bear market and the seller will not complain. They don't want to, they won't complain at all because they're, they're in a very weak position here. They don't want to scare you away. They don't want to scare you away. So they don't say anything. So I do an inspection. I said, well, you know, the paint is really old. I have to repaint it. I have to recarpet it, this and that. When you get that done, come back to me and then we'll make a deal. Otherwise, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep shopping. And then the seller said, no, no, don't leave, don't leave, don't leave. Um, how much is this, how much is the paint and carpet going to cost? Because it was a condo, it was already maintained. Yeah. I said, in my, in my mind, I knew it was going to cost maybe a thousand maximum and not much, but I just wanted to throw some complaint. And I said, I'll tell you what, you give it to me instead of 40, you give it to me for 35, I'll take it now. But I knew it only cost me a thousand to fix it anyway. So he was like, done, done, 35, sold. I said, great. I got a condo for 35. I negotiated from 40 down to 35, which made me think I should have negotiated down to 30, but I think they would have taken it too. They, they probably would have. <laughs> they were so much potted. You don't understand. So they sold it for 35. And uh, at that time, my agent closed it and he took the keys for the house, the locker, uh, the mailbox. And he says, what do you want me to do with these keys? I said, do you know a property manager? He's like, yeah, I know a few. So I called all the property managers and I interviewed them. And then um, I picked one and I said, give me an, they gave me an account manager. And I told my agent, I said, give the keys to my account manager. I've signed an agreement with them. They're going to take care of everything from then on. So they took the keys. They went in. I told them, you need to clean this up, change the carpet, paint the, they said, no problem. Within a week, it was done because all the trays were just sitting around. They had no work to do. So yeah. all the trays were available. So they fixed it like in five seconds, like they fix it up and it was ready for rent right away. And at $35,000 purchase price, I rented it out for 750. It's like, boom, 750 tenant wow. found right away. This and then, I, yeah. and I just did it again and again and again. Tip. And, um, then I, then six months later, that guy from Minnesota, from my old, old store, he's like, so how are you doing with those, uh, those stupid houses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said, and I said, I have like four of them. It's great. I'm, I'm cash flowing like $500 US from each one already 500 times four houses. Like that's like, that's good cash flow already. And, and there's still a lot of opportunity. And, um, and he's like, good, you know, you're doing good work. He's like, don't let me discourage you. You're doing a good job. It's just, you know, it's really slow though. And it's really slow. So a, a couple of days later passed and my agent calls me cause it's the same agent. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh my God, you won't believe what the Minnesota guy did. And I said, what did he do? We just closed on a 50 unit apartment building. I was like, what? What, what did he do? He's like, he paid 1.5 million for 50 units in this neighborhood. Wow. I was like, that was, I go, that's incredible. That's like $30,000 a door. That's cheaper exactly. than what I'm buying the houses for. Exactly. And I said, well, tell me, it must be all vacant. He's like, out of the 50, 10 are vacant. 40 of them are fully occupied paying 750. He's cash flowing already, cash flowing like you wouldn't believe. So it was the same number as your single family house, actually. Yeah. Well, my, my single family, no, my, yeah. my condo. My condo your, your was. Your condo, was condo, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Your condo. Wow. 750. And he, he's like, the blended rate is approximately 750. You know, some are paying 700, some are paying yeah. 800, but it's around there. And I said, that's insane. Like he, he dropped down 1 million in cash, bought a 50 unit apartment. And, and what he did was brilliant. The 10 units that were vacant, he started mm -hmm. renovating those. Yeah. Started renovating and not, not, not complex renovations. It was just paint and paint and carpet and maybe changing out some of the appliances. And in America back then, the tenant actually brought their own appliances. Some cases he didn't have to bring any appliances in. He just had to make sure it's clean and, and, the, and the electrical works. And then they, they can put in their own appliance. And, um, he started renting those out for like a hundred dollars more than what he was getting for the other 40. So as people left, he just kept like doing the same thing. And, and it's so funny before the virus crisis, I was talking to my agent again. I said, how's uh, Mr. Minnesota doing with his, uh, with his uh, 50 unit apartment? Did he sell it? And he's like, he's not going to sell it. I was like, he can, you know, in America, they have something called the 1031 exchange. You can 1031 yeah. it and buy something bigger. He's like, yeah, he could, but he's thinking about it. He's not, he's getting a lot of offers. 
he's getting offers north of six, seven, eight million dollars. Wow. He bought it for 1.5. Oh my God. And I said, well, what are the numbers like? He's like, well, there's no vacancy. It's a, we, they have a, they have a lineup to, to, wow. to rent that place, right? 50 units all full. And it's not 750 anymore blended. It's like 1300 blended. Oh my God. Really? Yeah. 1300, wow. almost 1400 well, blended. You, you bought at the bottom. So you can't, you know, it can't be worse than what it was. <laughs> it's almost, well, the, the, wow. the, what I was saying to my, the people who were asking, the prices that, that we were seeing then was lower than replacement value. You couldn't yeah, build exactly. Exactly. a structure for that price. No. You couldn't even build it for that price with the materials and the labor was free. Even if the labor was free, it'd be a challenge. With labor, it's impossible to build that condo, that house, that apartment for that for 30,000 30, a door. And that, that's actually a really good indicator also. You know, if, if the price is lower than what it would cost to build it. That's yeah. a no-brainer. Exactly. Hey, guys. Me and Jim kept continuing talking for so long that I had to cut this one in two parts. So don't worry. There's going to be a part two. But for this one, hope you like it. And the part two is even better. So don't miss it up. All right, guys. Thank you for watching. See you next time.